you want to stay more focused on the right goals in your life or even just figure out what the right goals are for you? Do you want clarity? Do you want better work-life balance? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to Success Through Failure. Welcome to the Success Through Failure podcast, the show that reveals failure as your path to success. You'll listen to intriguing interviews with some of the most successful people on the planet and learn how their failures became a launchpad for success and how yours can too. Here's your host, former Division I All-American wrestler, former Division I head coach, speaker, and personal coach, Jim Harshaw. Welcome to another episode of Success Through Failure. Today, I bring you Greg McEwen. Greg is an international speaker, leadership, and business consultant, and an author. He is the founder and CEO of This Inc., a leadership and strategy design agency based in Silicon Valley. His clients include Apple, Google, Facebook, Pixar, Salesforce, and Twitter. You may have heard of one or two of those. His most recent project, a book titled Essentialism, The Disciplined Pursuit of Less, which by the way became an instant New York Times bestseller, is a business and self-help book that challenges core assumptions about achievement to get to the essence of what really drives success, which is really what I want to talk about today. He speaks on how to live and lead as an essentialist. Greg earned his MBA from Stanford Graduate School of Business after studying communications and journalism at Brigham Young University. As usual, if you don't have time to listen to this entire episode, you've got to grab the action plan because there's a great action plan waiting for you from this episode and and every other episode. If you just go to jimharshawjr.com slash action. Greg, welcome to the show. It's uh, my pleasure to be with you. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for coming on. So I, your book is amazing. I know a lot of people have told you the same thing. It's really catching on. I feel like you're starting a movement. One of the key points early on in your book, Essentialism, is less but better. You say, quote, you cannot overestimate the importance of practically everything. I love that quote. You know, we, we live in a society where we just have, you know, we have, we have too much stuff stuff. We have too much food, too much media, too much to do, you know, just too much stuff. Less but better sounds good, but why? Why is less but better? Why is essentialism good and the right thing? Well, I think we have to start with sort of the counter argument, which is if non-essentialism or the undisciplined pursuit of more is working for you, that is, it's giving you what it says it will give you, which is everything you want, right? It, 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 if you try and do it all, you should have it all. That's the argument. So you should be having the relationships you want in your personal life. You should be, uh, you know, making breakthroughs in your professional life. You should feel uh, strong, healthy in, in, in yourself. Like if it's giving you the results that you want, keep doing it. Uh, the, 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 you know, consider essentialism and the disciplined pursuit of less uh, as an alternative if it's not working for you. That's, that's, I think, how I would start the conversation. When we see really successful people, they're busy, right? Um, I guess address that a little because they're, they're busy and, and we see, you know, they get a lot done, but is, is it just that they're getting more of the right things done? And, and this, I guess you can't really put all successful people in the same bucket because some of them were probably pulled too many different directions and they're not satisfied. I mean, this is really, I think it comes down to, to living a fulfilled life and being satisfied with what we are getting done. Um, but how, you know, how do we do that? How do we actually get, how do we come become an essentialist? I remember somebody that, uh, I, that I interviewed, uh, in preparation for the book who was successful in one company, went to a different company and, uh, it was a more bureaucratic company, as it turns out, and he wanted to be a good team player, so he started saying yes to everyone and everything. His stress goes up, the quality of his work goes down, and he almost thinks to leave the company, but he fortunately gets some advice that says, no, look, you've just got to become more selective, more thoughtful, sort of retire in role even. And so he applies this different lens. Uh, doesn't go to every meeting that he's invited to, thinks through, is this the very best use of me? And by the end of that year, he's back. He's eating 
dinner with his wife every night. He's going to the gym every night. He's uh, at work. He, uh, his performance evaluation goes up, and he ends that year with one of the largest bonuses of his whole career. And what he learned from this experience is if you simply say yes to everyone and everything, you won't be used at your highest point of contribution. And, and really, that's, that's the, the, the counter argument. I mean, he was applying non-essentialism. It didn't work. And, and that's really the problem with non-essentialism is it sounds good, but it's like, it's like, a, a, you know, it's like we, we're conned with the idea. It sounds like it's just, oh, great. We'll get everything we want if we try and shove it all in. It doesn't produce what is promised. Instead, you have to be disciplined about doing the right few things. And this is what actually produces breakthrough accomplishment. Yeah, it's interesting because I'm actually coaching an individual right now who, man, he's got his hands in so many buckets and, and he enjoys it. He's got a lot of things going on and he's pretty good at all of them, but he's not, he's not satisfied. He doesn't feel like he's, he's on track. He feels like he's doing a lot of things that he shouldn't be doing. And I mean, and I actually, I just recommended this book to him uh, a, a few days ago. Uh, and you talk about, I think one of the other quotes is in your book is something like, if you don't prioritize your life, somebody else will prioritize it for you. How do we go, like, how do we go about taking back control of our life? You know, we, you know, most, just about everybody listen to this, uh, you know, if they're not an entrepreneur, they're, they're, they've got a boss, you know, and even as an entrepreneur, you've, you've got, you know, you've got employees who are asking you things and you've got shareholders and you've got customers who you're answering to. How do we, how do we go about taking back control? How do we go about telling our boss no? Well, I learned this the hard way. Uh, the the problem side of this question that you're asking, we'll get to the solution in a moment. Uh, when I received an email from my boss at the time saying Friday would be a very bad time for your wife to have a baby <laughs> because, uh, you know, that's when I, I, I need you to be at this client meeting. And Friday, in fact, is when my wife into, went into labor. We're in the hospital. She's uh, everybody's well, but instead of me being focused on that clearly priority experience, I was trying to do what a non-essentialist does try to do, which is both. How do I do both? And so to my shame, I went to the meeting and afterwards the, my boss said, the client will respect you for the choice you just made. And I don't know that they did, but even if they did, I had made a fool's bargain. I had tried, I had violated something more important for something clearly less important on the basis that you can, if you can do them both, you'll get everything you want. I didn't. And that's when I learned this lesson. If you don't prioritize your life, somebody else will. And so you, you know, this was the spark for me in hindsight to go, to get serious about this, to learn, you know, learn better why I did what I was doing and how I got to be in this situation and why it is that other people get in this situation. That was kind of the, the, the spark up for essentialism in the first place. And yeah, along those lines, you talk about in the book that you can multitask, but you can't multifocus, right? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, you, you know, this is one of the, this is one of the beginning problems. A non-essentialist has been sold the idea you can do it all. I keep coming back to that because that's important. If it's true, you, people should keep doing it. If you can do it all and have it all, just keep doing that. But on the basis it might not work, on the basis that we actually can't multifocus, you can't do all of it at the same time without splitting the experience in some way. Uh, with, it, you know, the, it, the trade-offs are inherently real. And that I didn't make the world like that. And you didn't. No one, the person listening didn't make it that way. We just, that's the world we're inheriting. That's how it is. So now we have to either pretend it's not, which is what the non-essentialist tries to get us to do, or we face it and we, we, we embrace it like a, as, as the key, as indeed it is, to, uh, to, um, to strategy. You know, strategy is all about you know, three things, really. Strategy is all about Figuring out what is essential, eliminating what is not by making the right trade-offs, and then creating a system that supports that strategy over time about what things really matter most. And, and that right there is that those are like the three pillars of essentialism. Explore what is essential, eliminate what's not by making strategic trade-offs, and building a routine or a system that supports the things you've identified as most important. So that, that happens more and more of the time 
with less and less effort. That, those are the three things we have to do. Those are the principles, at least, the disciplines that make up essentialism. And you talk about making those routines because when you build those routines, it allows you to allows you to actually use that that energy, that creative energy that you're saving and not having to make decisions. So you can actually explore more and 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 be more creative and explore new things because when an essentialist, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean it's not a boring life, but it's an, it's an exciting life because you're focused on the things that you want to be focused on. You're focused on the right things and not all these other distractions because there's so many distract. I mean, there's so many distractions. We all know that. You know, we can't go five minutes without checking social media or our phone buzzing or, or someone popping by the office or a phone ringing or there's just there's so many distractions. But when you really hone it down to what's important, like you said, what's important, then then you live a more fulfilling life. And, I, and I've seen that. And uh, I mean, it's such a hard thing to do. And it's something I, I, I really believe in, something I've tried, tried to do with my life. And, uh, and and I'll go back to the book again. You, you talk about. Um, I think it was like a, a rugby coach who was a you know elite rugby coach and and they've won a ton of championships and and he always talks about winning. He always talks about win. You know, no matter what we do, we win. And and win stands for what's important now. And I have this this concept that I call the productive pause. The productive pause is a short period of I define it as a short period of focused reflection around specific questions that leads to clarity of action and peace of mind. So. It means stopping, getting off the treadmill of life, asking yourself the right questions, and then making decisions based on those answers. And you get you get clarity of action. You know, you know exactly the right thing to do. It's not just busy work you're doing. You're doing work that is moving you towards where you want to go. And and it leads to peace of mind. So this what's important now is is a really good way, I think, to, to, to start your day. And I think it's a, it's a great part of, of what I call the productive pause. Is, is that something that you do in your life or is that something that you teach or coach people to do is, is hit the pause button and, and ask themselves specific questions so they can actually begin to filter out the, the things that are unnecessary? Yes, I think that's absolutely right. And I think the metaphor to think about here is, uh, is one's closet uh, the, the closet is, yeah, you know what it's like. You, you, you slowly add to it and add to it until it's really this undisciplined pursuit of more. There's so much stuff in there, but you can't really find what you want. And then eventually you say, okay, I'm going to clear this all out. And you go and you take an item off the shelf as if to give it away. And in that moment, something almost magical happens, you know, something mysterious because of the item of take, go, going to give it away. You think, well, you know, I might need it again at some point. It might fit me again. It might come back into fashion again. And so we we end up keeping it. And we're keeping it because we're using the world's broadest criteria. And the criteria is, um, could I ever possibly maybe use this again? And that's the kind of criteria that the non-essentialist uses. Because the basic idea of a non-essentialist is this this. Uh, mind-bending, reality-bending idea that you can do everything, then you don't ask a specific, you know, cr- uh, um, like extreme criteria question. You use, use something broad as anything. Could it ever be useful? Or could I ever do this in my life? And because we ask such a broad question, the answer is yes. You know, so we might ask questions like, well, is this a good thing? Or is this a little bit interesting to me? Or did somebody mention I might want to do this or I should do this? These questions are so broad. The answer, of course, is yes. It's like our closet and the closet of our life just gets completely overwhelmed with endless things. And it's just too much. So what do you do with the closet? You know, you take one of the the top uh, thinkers in this area, not just thinkers, but uh, but practitioners, uh, Marie Kondo. She suggests this question. She says, of every item in your closet, one must ask, Pick each item up. Does it spark joy? Think of how selective of a question that is in comparison to the alternative that we've been describing. So similarly, in the closet of our lives, what I'm suggesting is by asking far more selective questions like, uh, is this my highest point of contribution? Is this this the very best use of me? Those are those are more selective questions. That's more thoughtful. That's more. Of course, the answer to that question is 
More often than not, it's no, no, it's good, but it's not great. It's a good use of me. It's, it's an interesting use of me. It's not the best use of me. And so in this way, we start to clear out the closet of our life. And what we're left with in the real closet of our life is we're left with just the things that spark joy. And it turns out that less can be better. The right few things is, can be more valuable, more enjoyable than tons of stuff that's not really the right thing. And it's the same for life. To be really selective about where we put our lives and what we put our energy on is more joyful, more substantive, more meaningful, and a bunch of stuff that doesn't mean much to us at all. That's what we're talking about. That's what essentialism can produce. Yeah, we live in a culture where you know, we're just encouraged to pursue more of everything, You know, whether it's on TV and commercials or uh, anywhere you, you look at media, it's, you know, you look at people doing things and having things and, and we want all of those. So we keep filling our, any free second, any free moment, any free piece of, you know, bandwidth of energy that we have, we're filling it with stuff and it's not always the right thing. And I think when we fill it with the right thing, we, we feel more productive. We are more productive. And this, you know, this is, this is, you know, for the listener, this is relevant for, business. It's relevant for coaching. It's relevant for relationships. It's relevant for your health. I mean, it's relevant in every, every area of your life. You know, I can, I think back to, uh, several years ago, uh, I raised some, some, uh, angel capital and, and built a software with a, a business partner. We built a, a software and, and it, it failed ultimately in the end it failed. And I look back and I was adding more and more features and in, in the end, after after I had shut things down, after I realized this is this is a no go, um, I went back to my customers and I started in my prospects and I started asking them different questions, the more more simpler questions about what's really important here, what do you want, you know? And they and I I, I knew what they wanted in terms of the outcome, so I created things that I thought would give them that outcome. It's not the but the, but I wasn't doing it in the way that they wanted, so I was adding all these I had all these great bells and whistles. I thought they were great bells and whistles. But I didn't, all I needed to do was build something so much simpler. And they actually told me exactly what I could have built uh, that they wanted. And I just wasn't asking the right questions, but it was, it was much simpler. It was much simpler than what I built, which I thought was, was fascinating. And there's this whole movement in, you know, in, in the entrepreneurial world around, around minimum viable product, you know, and iter, you know, putting out something simple and then iterating and, and adding on as, as, you know, as the market dictates. And, and I think that's relevant for, for every part of our life. So what kind of have you work with, you know, you worked with all these amazing companies and you work with, with amazing people. Um, what, what do you see that these high achievers do and have that sets them apart and helps them find success? What's that different differentiator that helps them, that helps them break through? Well, Warren Buffett's credited with having said this. Uh, I, I don't absolutely know he, he, that he did, but the idea that, the difference between successful people and very successful people is that very successful people say no to almost everything. And that's certainly been true in his life. Right? So he's, he's the most successful investor in history. Uh, and how has he done it? Did he do it by investing in everything? Did he do it in trying to go big on everything, try to fit it all in? Or did he have a different ethic in mind from the beginning? Did he have a different mindset? And, and it's clear that he did, 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 had a different mindset. As he came into his uh, investing life, so towards the beginning, he had this idea that he couldn't possibly be right thousands of times. So he needed to be really careful in getting the right few big decisions uh, right. Uh, he likened it to like a punch card, you know, like that maybe has 20 punches on it. And, and every time he made an investment decision, he'd be using up one of those, one of those uh, punch cards, one of those holes. And so it meant that was he, as he came to investments, he didn't do the messing around. He didn't say, OK, I'm going to just try and do it that comes my way and everything that seems good, you know, back to the closet analogy. He's not just trying to say yes to everything that's an interesting opportunity. And when they find exactly what they're looking for, they go big and they invest for the long run. Uh, by doing that, uh, he has been able to, I mean, it's now looking back over his career, it is true that 90% of his fortune can be traced back to about 10 investment decisions. 
But he knew it'd be like that in the first place. So that approach, he says, he says, our investment strategy borders on lethargy. Huh. And that's really what I'm describing here for life as well. Like when we talk about effortless execution, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, it, I, I read, uh, I think it was called the Warren Buffett way or the Buffett way, I think a few years ago. And it's such a simple investing strategy. <laughs> you feel like you don't need to know that much about investing to be able to, to, be able to, to, to execute it. It's, it is based on very, uh, a very simple, simple, seemingly, seemingly replicable process, but that, you know, and I know, I know a lot of investors. I went to the University of Virginia. There's a lot. Of, it's just a big finance school, and a lot of my friends. I mean, it's so you know they make it sound so complex when you talk to them. But you read about Warren Buffett's investment strategy, and it's just it's extremely simplified. So um, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It's a great analogy. Yeah, and it's and it's about uh, you know in our lives creating the space to explore what is essential, figuring that out. There's so many of us are so reactive to what's going on, to the latest email, to the latest text, the latest news update, to the latest tweet, you know, the latest item on Twitter, to, that this stuff consumes our life. Now, I'm not saying to be a Luddite to throw all this away, but in this environment, we have to now create space. We have to put it back into our life to do other things, to figure out what matters. And so I would argue that people need to, for example, schedule a personal quarterly offsite. They put that on their calendar every quarter, take one day to focus on the things that matter most, to make sure that in the big picture, we're aligned on the, on the right things. And then every week to have on the calendar a weekly essential planning design session where you, you're figuring out how do I make sure that the most important things get done this week? The big things, the big rocks. And then third, it's daily doing the same thing where you're just saying, okay, here are each day, here are the few things that I think are essential. I sort of say six, I say sort of three personal, three professional, uh, the most. And, uh, and, and that becomes, you, you know, you, you take that six, you prioritize the list, you cross off the bottom five, and then you're left with like the priority, the big thing that you need to focus on first and you work on that and you get it done. And so these are some of the things I suggest that help, I think, to create a cadence of, uh, of exploration so that we can start answering this question that Larry Gelwick's uh, put to his team of what's important now. You can't just answer that if you just ask it with no thought. You suddenly, hey, what's important now? You don't know the answer. Nobody knows the answer to that. But if we create these cadence of reflective periods, these windows, then we can, then we can do it. Does it make sense? Yeah, a hundred percent. You know, you won't be surprised to learn, Greg, that the single most common habit of my guests, and I have just, you know, high achieving, high performers, the single most common habit is they do some sort of what I call a productive pause is they, they journal or they meditate or they pray. They hit the pause button. Most of them on a daily basis. And they have a quiet time and, and they actually think and reflect on what's important. Well, that makes so much sense to me that that would be the, the, the common theme through, through what you're describing. Uh, because, uh, because, so, because so much of life is noise and so few things in life are really valuable. We don't live in a 50-50 world where 50% of effort produces 50% of results. What we have is a world where a tiny amount of the things – it, it, the inputs produce incredible results. So this is the justification for creating space to think and reflect and not just to react. Uh, I mean, it's funny when you make that list of the productive pause, it's funny to, to think of how, how different pieces of that have now built, come into what I hope is, a, is an ever developing uh, essentialist routine for me. Uh, yeah, so the journaling, for example, so I write a journal every, every single day. Uh, so I, I really pretty sure I haven't missed a day now in the last five and a half years, uh, and, and hardly a day in the last decade or even 15 years now. 
this this is and it now more even than ever before i i look forward to it it rejuvenates me it's a it is a productive pause as i just get to celebrate every every essential win everything that was important that happened i learned from that i get to feel satisfied with that uh you know it's sort of a, a counter to this uh, to the non-essentialist idea of oh you know there's a, everything's essential and you haven't got anything done and it's that sort of sense of stress that people have, uh, it, it, it pushes against that, helps me to pause and say, yeah, lots of good things are happening, great things are happening, be grateful for those things. So I do that. In the morning, I, I definitely have a, a period of time where I'm reading wisdom literature, scripture for me, uh, and then with my family and with my wife, like that's really important uh, to be able to steady the day, to center it in the things that matter. I have a, a, a routine I follow when I first wake up in the morning, the very first thing. Uh, I, I've learned there's a little bit of a battle first thing in the morning between the the, the worries and the, you know, the, the things that you are concerned about on the one hand. And, and if I'm not careful, and I think certainly if anybody has the first thing they do be check their phone, they just pull, pulled into that. And, uh, and, and so I've developed a, a simple process where my first thinking routine is what are three things I'm really grateful for? What are the two or three big goals that I'm now working on over the next 90 days to, to maybe to longer, 90, six months to a year, maybe even, but two or three goals that I, I just want to keep coming back to. Uh, and I just reflect on that for a moment and then think about how can I serve people today? What are two or three things I can do for other people? And, and I just keep coming back to those each morning. I find that very healthy. And, uh, and, and so all of these things, all these practices, I think, fall under, you know, can certainly fall under this category that you're describing. Yeah, no question. It's, uh, you know, when, when, you, when you hit that pause button, it just helps. So how do you journal? I mean, just real quickly, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of curious about this. I, I journal on, on a regular basis, but it's certainly not every day. It's not even every week, but it's... Um, uh, I journal when I feel like I just need clarity and it gives me that clarity when I just feel clouded and I, I, I don't know exactly what I'm, I should be focusing on. That's when I journal. What do you, what do you journal about every day? Just real briefly. Uh, I, I begin with, I mean, my whole journal begins with, I am thankful for. Uh, so each, each, each sentence or each paragraph begins with that. Oh man, I tell you, I, I love doing that. It just, it, the, the degree to which it restores perspective the degree to which it, it, you know, non-essentialism tends to get us just distracted by the trivial many. And so what it does is it doing that distorts our perspective. It helps us to believe that things are different than how they actually are. And by asserting, I am grateful for, I mean, I am thankful for, and as soon as you do that, it opens this window uh, of the, the, of, of, re, of restorative perspective. I have sometimes played with, with gratitude with, with our children. We, if we're in the car or something and, 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 some, and it gets grumpy, uh, whatever, right? We'll like pause and go, okay, time out. Okay, everyone in the car has to say two things they're grateful for, three things they're <laughs> grateful for. Yeah. And here's what's curious about doing that is that at first, certainly the people who are most you know, grumpiest, you know, if, you know, they'll do it, but they'll do it sort of pretty unwillingly, right? Sure. They'll say, okay, I'm thankful that dad and asked us to make a thankful list, right? Or whatever. <laughs> but here's what's amazing is that within a very short time, even when we are grateful with a degree of, I don't know what it is, uh, unwillingness, a degree of grumpiness, a degree of cynicism, it changes the feeling still. And it isn't, I, I can hardly think of a time we've done this that it hasn't almost immediately made people start laughing yeah. and it's a reset and suddenly we're seeing things differently again. So it doesn't, I think gratitude is one of these things that even when you try to do it, even when you're like doing it grumpy, it still works, it's still more powerful. Than <laughs> yeah. And it still I don't think, helps us to see what is important, what's essential in our lives. Yeah. I don't think you can be grateful and like pissed off at the same time. <laughs> That's what it seems to be. That seems to be that's that seems to be my experience with it. You yeah. just it, it just um, uh, it, it's just one of those things that um, uh, that one, one thing can't exist 
where uh, th where the other exists. That's that's my experience. So tell us about yourself, Greg. How did you get to this point? Uh, obviously, you know, for, you, you've got a British accent. You've broken the British barrier on the Success Through Failure podcast, by the way. So the sky's the limits for love it for the British on this show now. But um, so tell us a little bit about your background. How did it get? To this point, how did you get to be an essentialist and writing about it and believing in this and starting this movement? I mean, what led to this? Well, I mean, the the I shared one story about uh, you know the, the this hospital moment, this fail, uh, but the 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 story more broadly than that started uh, you know, I don't know seventeen and a half years ago now when I was staring at a piece of paper in my hands. I uh, just had a meeting and walked out and somebody had said to me, hey, if you do decide to stay in America, you should come and help us with this, you know, this project. And so I sat, it, it sat down, made it a brainstorm for 20 minutes. on this piece of paper. What would you do if you could do anything? And when I was finished, what I noticed was not what was on the list, but what was not on the list. And law school was not on the list. And so... Uh, that was a problem because I was at the time at law school. And so what do you do? Uh, visiting a friend here in the United States, uh, but I'm at law school in England. I, uh, in the end, I quit law school. And uh, although I'll tell you, the conversation with my, with my parents was kind of fun <laughs> on that one. I uh, so I, I, I call, I call the 15 digit number back to England and my, uh, my mother answers, fortunately, and she listens and she says, she says, she says listen, um, I think you better talk to dad. <laughs> and no, then he I, comes on the I phone. I don't want to talk to dad. So what, what would you say to your son after all that time, all that effort, all that money, call you from halfway around the world and they yeah, I, I want to do something different on a, on a whim. What are you going to say? <sighs> Give, go back to school. <laughs> Yeah, you just just keep going. Don't quit. Um, this is this is important. Sure, you come this far. No, you. Uh, why would you throw this away? Why would you not do this? And my uh, my dad listens, and he says, uh, "Son, he says, you know, you know, you know what we've always told you. Yeah, because all Englishmen quote Shakespeare." <laughs> over tea and crumpets for breakfast in the morning. <laughs> That's he what I pictured. Out. That's what I thought. That's exactly so. And he pulls out this line. He says, he says, he says, you know what we've always told you. By the way, what do you think he's always told me? Finish what you started? <laughs> yeah. D d d go to law school. Uh, you know, this, this, is, this is what we need you to do. Keep going. No, here's, here's what he said he'd always told me. He said, uh, it's a quote from Hamlet, uh, to thine own self be true. That's what we've always told you, to thine own self be true. Uh, now, actually, he never said that to me in his whole life. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's a convenient so, quote to use at the time, though. Exactly. But it, in fact, was, it was, that was right. Like, that's the idea. You, 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 you don't, he said, choose what is right, let the consequence follow. Yeah. Yeah, both of those are truly great pieces of advice. The second yeah. may be more important than the first, in a sense. To, you know, at any point in your life, somebody's listening to this now. It doesn't matter what they've done before. It doesn't matter what mistakes they've made. It, what matters is what they do now. Choose what is right. Let the consequences fall. You have a choice. You don't have to do what you're doing. You don't have to live out of your past. You don't have to keep making the decisions the way you have before. You have a choice. Essentialists have a heightened awareness of their ability to choose. Indeed, the mindset of an essentialist has as an idea that you cannot give away your ability to choose. You can't even give it away. You can only forget that you have it. Like somebody can't take it away. You, nothing. You just have to make you can forget you can have it. You can pretend you don't have it. You can tell yourself you don't have it. You can blame other people for your circumstances. You could claim endless victimhood in the world, but you still have a choice of what to do next. Yeah. And that is something that I think logically is true. I think people probably know it's true logically, but emotionally sometimes we don't know it's true. And that was true for me in law school is I don't have a choice. I have to do this. And... Yeah. 
as soon as I discovered I didn't have to do it, then that was the beginning. That was the beginning of the end. I never went back to law school, quit, pursued what I really wanted to do, which was to teach, was to write. And, and, and deeply embedded in that desire was a question that I have been asking these many years. And here's the question is, why is it that otherwise successful people and companies don't break through to the next level? That's really what I have been studying. The answer to that question turned out to be success, that success can become a catalyst for failure. Success itself. And here's where I noticed it. So I, I, I observed this phenomenon working with companies in Silicon Valley where in the early days they're focused on the right few ideas at the right time. But immediately it proliferates as they start. No, no, not immediately. They, they become successful. Right? They're focused on the right idea at the right time. They become successful. What comes with success is an increase of options and opportunities. And if we're not careful about that, then we start to look like the – you know, the closet we're talking about earlier. There's so many options and opportunities and we're trying to say yes to everything and everyone. And it undermines the very things that led to breakthrough success in the first place. And so although this undisciplined pursuit of more, of having all these options and opportunities, don't kill a company or immediately, they do explain why they plateau, why they can't keep scaling, why they can't keep going. Because now they're just dividing their increased resources between an endlessly and faster increased, increasing number of activities. And with all of that, it adds complexity and complexity has costs to it and so on. And so you have this situation where, where I mean, it says Bill Gates said it, success is a poor teacher. Yeah. It's, it's a suddenly you say, okay, we have to not be anti-success. We have to become successful at success. We have to become successful at success. Yeah. And that's what essentialism is about. It's the antidote to that problem. Essentialism is really written for people who are already successful. You know, they're driven. By definition, a non-essentialist is driven, capable, curious, wants to achieve. And that has probably taken them to a certain place, a certain degree of actual success. But, uh, but then it has plateaued because that approach will only work for so long. That will get clothes into the closet, but it will also then lead you to being overloaded in there. Yeah. And so you have to remove, you have to become more selective. Do you want to go through to the next level of success? And for the listener, there's the, the, Greg goes so much deeper in, in such a powerful book in essentialism. So I definitely recommend for the listener, you, you check that out. If you listen to a podcast, you might like audio books. And that's, that's how I, I, that's how I read the book is through audio book. Greg, I ask all my guests to share a time where they failed. You know, you wrote a book. It was an instant New York times bestseller Stanford, you know, graduate school of business an amazing graduate, you know, business school has everything you've ever touched turned to gold or have there been times where you've felt, you know, where you've failed and, and maybe learned from that and become better or stronger for it. But was there a time where you felt, you know, hopeless and, and like, like, you know, uh, you know, you had one of those dark days. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, I, let me just put this into context here. I, I think that, I think that there's only really two kinds of people in the world. There are people who are lost and then there are people who know they are lost. And I, I think that it's success to be in the second category. It, it, or it's, it's the beginning of essentialism to be in the second category, to face it, to admit it. So, I mean, this happened. This is, my, this is the perpetual journey for me. I don't, I don't feel like. I'm up on the mountaintop going, I have arrived and it's marvelous, it's beautiful and everyone run up here with me. I, I am in this. I'm in the real world with family, with community commitments, church commitments. I may want to make a difference. Uh, far more, far more options and opportunities than I can possibly respond to. Um, that's a good problem to have, but it does turn out, as I've mentioned, to be a problem. So I feel like I, I live in the space that we're in. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> And, uh, and so the difference between the essentialist and the non-essential, the difference for me on a good day versus a bad day is that I face it, I admit it, 
you know, so then, then you know what to do because if you're lost and you admit that you're lost, you know what to do. You stop, you pause, you think, you make, you make the daily list, you plan the week, you think long term, you reattach to the goals, you, you, you face the new realities. And so I feel like, I feel like that is the perpetual, even the disciplined pursuit of my life. And I, and I, I, I feel like uh, very frequently in uh, in this in this tension and uh, and and I feel that that the path of the essentialist ends up being the way out not just one time in my life in this I quit law and then it's all pretty after that or uh, the hospital moment and then after that I get it all right no no it's not like that it is coming back to this again and again the metaphor I would use is is like making a flight right if I'm going from San Francisco to New York the flight, the plane is off track 90% of the time. And it comes, it gets to where it's supposed to get to because it comes back on track. It keeps coming back to the path of the essential. And that's how I feel about my life. I feel like we are, I'm constantly pulled, just like the rest of us. The question is for me and for you, for every listener, is how quickly do you come back to the essential path? To How quickly do you admit that you're off track Therefore, you can come back on track. Yeah, it's important for the listener to understand is, is you don't just get to the holy land by, you know, you don't just turn the page and boom, all of a sudden life is easy and you're able to cut everything out. It's You're constantly flooded and bombarded, especially in a situation like yourself. And, you know, a lot of my listeners have families. You've got four children, three girls and a boy, and, and you're pulling a lot of different directions. So can you give us, you know, a lot of my listeners like to get practical, actionable items out of these, these episodes. Is there something, Greg, that you can offer that, that we can do in the next, let's say, 24 to 48 hours, that, some kind of action that we can take to start living more like an essentialist? Yes, I think that, I mean, I, I will come back to, 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 the, to some of the things I've suggested before, but I, I think that if there's, if there's one thing to do, uh, I would schedule these personal quarterly offsite. Just schedule it. Just that's it. You don't even have to do it yet. Just schedule it uh, every ninety days for a year. Say, okay, we're going to do it once in the next month, and then January, and then you know, ninety days for the next year. It's not hard to do it. Take would about that, two minutes. Would that be the same schedule for it. the individual? For for you know uh, the 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 teacher who's listening or the absolutely uh, solo I, entrepreneur. I, absolutely. That's what I would suggest it for. I think every person listening should schedule this time. And if they if their work environment is such that they need to be on a Saturday, fine. But we need to create space to figure out what's essential, to think about it, to pause, to reflect, to get out physically. I mean, my wife and I go and do the, the quarterly offsite together, and we go to a particular place to do this and 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 get to talk about it and get to design things. And and that doesn't mean that our life is all sorted out. Of course it's not, like I've been describing. Uh, but but I think that if you schedule it and you, then it comes on your calendar, you suddenly have this reminder, this thing, and you design this day so that you just uh, never get more than 90 days away from being focused on what really matters most. Yeah. Uh, so that, that's if there's one thing, I would just start there. Uh, I have other suggestions, but I think that's the one I would come back to. Yeah, great advice. And it's such – such a, a, a great time, I think, in the world to have someone like you with a message like this come along because there's more there are more distractions now than ever. You know, there there you know we've got a a phone in our pocket that can you know just give us you know twenty four seven entertainment and uh, and occupation and you know there's there's no better time to hear a message like yours. So, Greg, thank you so much for making time to come on the show. Where can the listener? Learn more about you. Find you know, find you, follow you, etc. Uh, listen, I think uh, gregmcewen dot com uh, is probably the place to go. G r e e g m c k e o w n uh, or Gregory McEwen is my Twitter handle uh, or LinkedIn for those that it uses there. Uh, it's a uh, yeah, post from time to time there as well. So I look forward to continuing the conversation. And for the listener, I will have links to everything he just mentioned there. I'll have, you know, he had a bunch of great quotes and commentary throughout the, uh, throughout the podcast. So jimharshawjr.com slash action to get the action plan from this episode. Greg, thanks for making the time to come on the show. Thank you ever so much for having me. 
And for the listener, until next time, take the time to get clear on your goals and embrace failure as a stepping stone on your path to success. Success Through Failure is a member of the Athlete on Fire podcast network. Check out all of our shows at athleteonfire.com.